uh, Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. So I rise as the lead speaker on behalf of the government. Um, to respond to the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Bill 2024. Now, we certainly acknowledge that uh, the uh, mover of the, uh, of the bill um, representing the Legalised Cannabis Party was elected to this parliament with a specific uh, policy agenda and a specific um, amendment. But to the, and to the extent that uh, the government's um, recognised that and been able to facilitate that, we've done that, uh, most obviously through our support for uh, the members select committee into cannabis and hemp. But we do not support the decriminalisation of cannabis for personal use. Um, as some members might recall, we've had several debates and parliamentary questions uh, on the legalisation of cannabis uh, since, in fact, since 2017. We've consistently said government has no change to its position on cannabis laws. We do remain committed to ensuring there is access to medicinal cannabis for people with medical needs, and that includes enabling uh, general practi practitioners to prescribe medicinal uh, cannabis to patients, and following one of the recommendations made by the Select Committee, uh, the Department of Health is establishing the Medicinal Cannabis and Safe Driving Working Group. That group will bring together members with experience in clinical medicine, road traffic legislation and other relevant fields to consider the issue of medicinal cannabis and driving. Um, overseas, examples of decriminalisation have had mixed experiences. While in places like Portugal it has been seen as a success, in others, um, like Oregon in the USA, it's been seen as a failure. The ACT government introduced laws to decriminalise drugs for personal use uh, last year, and there's been a diverse range of opinion about that decision. Um, members, while I again acknowledge that the Honourable Brian Walker is bringing to the House legislation that is directly linked to uh, why his party um, was successful, the government cannot support it. Members, we are considering the Misuse of Drugs Amendment Lawful Personal Use of Cannabis Bill 2024, and the question is the bill be read a second time. The thank, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. I wasn't intending to speak, but I think we're probably going to bring this debate to a, to a conclusion, so I will make a few comments. Uh, my views on this issue are uh, well known and that of the uh, Liberal Party and the Alliance. Uh, well, no, we will not be supporting the bill. Um, and all you have to do is to go back to my inaugural speech to see where I stand personally on this. And I have had considerable experience with regard to drug education over multiple decades. That goes way back from when I was first to Chalky, then I was put on the National School Drug Education Committee. We <clears throat> produced a report uh, with regard to um, the education of um, uh, uh, drug education across the nation, to have some sort of uniform approach towards drug education. The West Australian education system is very proactive in this space from both sides of the chamber and very effective. Um, now, I, I acknowledge the passion of the Honourable Brian Walker with regard to this issue um, and um, his um, dare I say it, his um, view, I think, that cannabis is the panacea for all ills in society. Uh, but but uh, personally, I don't see it that way. I remain convinced that, I don't care how you put it, cannabis is an entrance drug. And juveniles and kids, and regardless of the age, start somewhere, more often than not with cannabis. Um, now, I'll go back and, and just talk briefly about a couple of personal anecdotes with regard to this situation. Um, and as I've said on numerous occasions, back when I was a, a teenager, cannabis was a hanging offence and smoking was socially acceptable. Now, it appears almost the other way in a lot of areas in that smoking is a, is a, a hanging offence and... and <laughs> you had to see it to, to understand where it was coming from. And, um, and um, cannabis um, 
is ever so increasingly becoming socially acceptable. And that is because um, it's seen as being not just um, a, as I say, a gateway to, uh, or an entrance drug, but you know, it's just everyone does it so it's okay. But that doesn't mean it's okay. It simply does not mean it's okay, in my view. You know, to, if, if, you just, if we get to that point as a society where we're saying it is okay and it doesn't really matter, well, um, we may as well, you know, uh, lock up on the way out. So, um, and that's how, that's how we feel, you know, and I don't feel like a, like a philistine or a dinosaur because I have those views. I think it's a responsible position to have. Now, you know, we, it's, it's pointless. I do get to the point where, where the, that, that situation for decades and for generations where if you uh, engaged in cannabis use, it literally was a hanging offence. It was, you were socially, you were ostracised so much and legally ostracised so much. You know, we've moved on from that, uh, from, um, that endeavour, but to actually accept it as uh, in law, to me, is unacceptable. And I have told this story before, so I apologise for those who have heard it, but I will tell the story about a young man that I, was, I taught at Scotch. Um, and this was how bad it was, and that, but at the same time it was very, very important we did have a line in the sand with, the, with cannabis use. And there was this, and I'm not going to name him, um, but he was from a, 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 a very comfortable background and a very, um, dare I say it, a, a very supportive family, extremely supportive family. And um, I was a, one of the roles I had at Scotch was a house head, as, in addition to my academic and tennis um, responsibilities, I was a house head, which was a pastoral role. And this young man, after a house meeting one day, one of the year eights came in and said, oh, sir, um, someone's left his wallet in the house room. So I took it and I opened the wallet to see who it belonged to, and there was a little stash of, of cannabis in the, in, the, um, in the wallet. And so I just put it on the desk there, and I've said before, let's call him Jake. About five minutes later, Jake came running, knocks on the door, rushes in, and he was evidently unnerved. So I said, apparently you've got, my, you've got my wallet. And I said, yeah, I have, Jake. Yeah, here it is, mate. So I gave him the wallet, and he started to walk out, and you could feel the blood ooze from his face. Anyway, he, um, he just about got out the door, and I said, um, hey, Jake, and he said, yes, sir. I said, um, if it happens again, mate, you and I won't be the only ones that know about this. And um, he said, yeah, thanks, sir, and he, he took off. Now, if I'd handled it differently and, and taken Jake to the headmaster, he would have automatically been suspended and he would have been ostracised and he would have had that cloud over his head. You know, he was year 12, my dad, he's year 12. So that would have had put a definite stain on that young man's um, reputation within that community and beyond. Um, then, two years later, I was at my place in Subi and I had some friends over and we got some, um, we got pizza for dinner and um, uh, Chelsea pizza, great pizzas. And um, anyway, the, um, there was a knock at the door about half an hour later I open up the door and here's Jake, right? And he had his pizzas, he was delivering pizzas. And he used to do, um, I don't know if he still does, well this is, no he probably doesn't, this is almost 20 years ago. Um, he, um, he'd be a middle aged man now. Yeah. And he, and he, he um, used to do, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, you know on the, with the C, what do you call them? You know when they, um, God I've got a mental blank. Yeah. <laughs> He was really good at it. He was a great swimmer and he used to do um, surf life saving. That's it, surf life saving. Anyway, I open up the door and I said, Jake, and he says, um, hi, sir. I said, you don't have to call me sir anymore. You can call me Peter. And he says, um, yes, sir. So I said, okay. And um, I said, how's the, how's the surf life saving going? And, uh, and he was still doing it at that stage. He's doing engineering at UWA. Anyway, I said, good on you, mate, well done. And he turned around and walked, started to walk off. And again, he stopped, then he stopped. And he turned around and he says, oh, thanks, sir. And um, he and I knew what that, was, that message was all about. That, that's not a vanity exercise. It was just a, uh, just, 
he and I knew that had I done something different or handled it differently, his life would have changed. And we have moved on with cannabis. In, if you use that as type example A to the community, we have moved on. Yes, we have. But we haven't, fortunately, in my view, got to the point where we, uh, we, where we legalise it. And I hope we never do, with all due respect. And I understand the passion of the honourable member, and I understand, you know, all of the things he makes. I'm, I'm with the leader of the house on this one. There are mixed results with regard to this. It's very easy to be selective and pick out one particular area. There are mixed results internationally. I'm very, very accustomed to this this um, this um, uh, issue. I was also on the state. Um, school Drug Education um, Committee at that stage before um, it's morphed into the in, in with the um, drivers uh, uh, license uh, driver education etc. So I was did, did all in those two committees at the state and the national level before I got into Parliament, and we did an enormous amount of work there to try and develop an education system, try and develop an education process uh, in terms of um, whether you take that abstinence approach or the harm minimisation approach or how you educate children into the fact that illicit drug use ultimately has the potential to have an, an, a, an ex, a significant negative impact on your life. And if we can curb every avenue into that higher order illicit drug use, we should do it as a community. We should do it. And our education, it's duty bound upon us to make sure we educate our children to ensure that they understand that high level illicit drug use always ends in tears. And as you get to the point now where you've got, uh, you, know, you know, massive meth problem within our community, they all started somewhere. They didn't just go straight from naught to meth, I promise you. They just didn't. And that's shown through, through multiple, multiple um, research papers with regard to drug use. If anyone thinks someone all of a sudden goes out to a party and all of a sudden starts taking heroin or cocaine or meth, they are naive in the extreme. It does not work that way. So I think all the facts need to be on the table before we just blindly go in and say, yep, because it's working here, or it's doing this, or, you know, there's... Um, you know, that has these medical benefits, etc. Therefore, we should carte blanche um, legalise it. Uh, I think is is the wrong way to go. So, um, as far as the opposition is concerned, uh, we understand that society has moved on, but we have not got to that point, and I hope we ne do never get to that point, where we say, um, well, actually, everyone's doing it, so we may as well just legalise it. You know, we'll take the easy option, we'll just legalise it. No, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. You know, when you go weak at the knees, you may as well give up. You know, don't do it. It's the same as anything in society. You always, as soon as, soon as you start making uh, allowances or taking the easy way out, just give up. So, by all means, present arguments for medicinal use of, of cannabis or other areas, but have a carte blanche approach to it and just say, no, we are going to legalise it, will have significant neg negative ramifications. And for that reason, the opposition will not be supporting the legislation. Members, the question is the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Brian Walker in reply. Thank you, President. And I have to say thank you also to Leader of the House for, for working with us on getting this bill at least uh, read uh, to this uh, degree. Um, and I, I do thank also the government for what they've done. The Select Committee certainly was a very important uh, uh, starting point. I regret, however, that the Medical Cannabis THC Driving uh, Working Group still has not been formed 10 months after the, uh, the agreement was made to do this, which means that the urgency is not there. So could I ask you, please, to give a little bit more effort into making this happen? Because we need the facts. Because, as the Leader of the Opposition has said, the Honourable Member, um, uh, there is need for actual evidence of what's going on. Because doing things in the dark, doing things without the science, is really not a clever idea. We need to know what's going on. Now, I will take issue, however, with what my honourable colleague, the Honourable Peter Collier, said. I have to state quite clearly, if I believed what you believe, I would agree with you entirely. 
why do I not believe what you believe in? It's because I've seen the facts. Now, you made a number of, uh, of, of uh, assertions there, and from what you have observed, I could understand where you come from. You first of all stated that uh, cannabis is a gateway drug. Now, this is a very common misperception. Now, I understand where you're coming from, but the international repeated research shows very clearly that cannabis is not a gateway drug. If you make it illegal, that people have to access it illegally, they then come into contact with criminals who want to sell other drugs. Absolutely, that can be the case. If that is not the case, it is not. You're not associating with criminals. The real gateway drug to further drugs is, in fact, alcohol. And, if, and that's a, a proven fact, alcohol, something freely available. And if we go even further, the real gateway into all of our drug misuse is actually trauma, something I see on a regular basis in my clinic. So I would, I would counsel here to uh, revise that opinion because it is plainly not attested to by the actual facts. Uh, I'm also pleased to recognise that it's been noted here that cannabis is becoming socially acceptable and about time too. I would put the point across. You know, I'm speaking here as a doctor and also as the leader of the Legalised Cannabis Party. So you can expect some degree of bias on one side because of my, my political affiliation. On the other hand, there has to be some degree of acceptance of my ability to see things from a medical view, from a, a, an experienced medical practitioner's view. Yes, we've got the medical experience of using cannabis for a wide variety of things. And here, I have to point out, I, I made the interjection uh, earlier on, I do not say that cannabis is a universal panacea. In fact, specifically, when I'm talking to patients, I mention this, it is not a panacea. It is, however, a very good drug for managing the endocannabinoid system, which is a system devoted to, to the homeostasis in the body. What we're actually looking at here is the result of decades of propaganda. If a lie is told often enough, we begin to believe it. And this is something we need to actually stand up against because we need to stand for truth, we need to stand for science. And so I, 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 I very much value the input of people with different points of view because then we can discuss them from the point of view of what are the actual facts, not what are the prejudices or the biases which manipulate your thoughts into a particular course of action. Now, for example, it was said here that uh, cannabis use for students can lead to uh, great severe problems with, say, mental functioning. You know, I would agree with that. I absolutely would agree with that. If we are going to treat cannabis as an illegal, as an illicit substance, then we can say, ah, use of the illicit substance resulted in this. What, I ask, however, is the result when we have a, a legal substance, alcohol, and it destroys the ability to function, especially given to young people uh, with growing brains, what happens to their ability to function in school and outside of school? It's exactly the same as cannabis. No, it's not. It's much worse. It is much worse. So abusing any substance is going to be deleterious to the individual's health, well-being, and future prospects. I would agree with that entirely. And that, members, that, friends, is the reason why we must regulate cannabis as a legally provided opportunity, much like alcohol, but regulated also, and this is where the Legalised Cannabis Party stands, we need to treat cannabis just the same as alcohol. In fact, I would be suggesting we ought to have more restrictions on alcohol because of the damage it is causing throughout our society. And cannabis does not. Alcohol given to the growing brain in indigenous communities is one reason why we have such a lot of problems in the remote and rural regions. Parents who are drinking alcohol during pregnancy are causing a surge of patients in, uh, I call them patients, into Banksia Hill. And we have a terrible trouble in managing the social complications due to alcohol. Were we to make cannabis illegal, and were it to be regulated such that under 18s had no access to this, much like we do with alcohol, if at all possible, what, I ask you, consider for a moment, what would happen in Northbridge? How would the policing change? How would business change? Would we be able to access that uh, after midnight for a pleasant night out with friends without the fear of being king hit by someone who has taken alcohol on board? Has it ever happened when someone has been high 
on cannabis. Now, I have to make a statement here. I thoroughly disapprove of using anything to get high. It's just not, not a good idea. We need to have our brains, our wits about us. We need to use what we have available properly. Much like, as you have probably noticed when I'm in the dining room here, I will enjoy a glass of gin and tonic. I don't drink the whole bottle. I did once. Never again. And that could have killed me. Had I taken a, a, a whole load of cannabis, which, by the way, I've never, ever, ever used, had I done that, it wouldn't have nearly killed me. It can't. So there's a marked difference between what we tolerate socially and call legal and what we tolerate socially but call illegal. And that plainly is wrong. So I do much appreciate uh, that at least minds are now open to consider this possibility because we need to follow science, we need to follow facts. What we do not need to do is to follow propaganda and innuendo and pseudo facts. Let's take, for example, why do we call cannabis illegal just now? Why is it dangerous? Why do we call it, for example, a narcotic? Now, bearing in mind, I have said that internationally, we have laws which state that cannabis is a narcotic. And that, as I have said before and repeatedly, is a lie. It's a pharmacological lie. It's been propagated by politicians and lawyers who want to make this impossible to achieve. Why? Why? Well, the answer was the original reason for this being made so unpopular in the US was because they wanted to prevent women from associating with Negroes who might then appreciate jazz and smoke cannabis. The speech by Henry Anslinger in 1930-something is an example of a racist, xenophobic rant which would have brought joy to the face of any Ku Klux Klan member. And anyone now who continues on that path to support this as, a, as an illegal substance is actually supporting a racist, xenophobic point of view which has no place in civilised society at all. Not then, and especially not now. The FBI then wanted to say, right, let's find a way of oppressing. Because alcohol, you see, had now been um, uh, legalized again, so all the, the alcohol runners uh, were out of a job. But also the FBI agents chasing the alcohol runners were also out of a job. How do you find the job for 7,000 FBI agents? Well, let's pivot to cannabis. That way they could continue oppressing the Hispanics and the Negroes in the southern states of America with impunity. And that racist mentality exists today. Are we aware that the Ill illegal approach to, uh, of using cannabis was a justification used by Nixon for oppressing the students who were opposing the Vietnam War, a war which was created illegally and in which thousands of young people died on all sides? Economies were destroyed. And they blamed the ones who were asking for peace and freedom in the world. They blamed them and said they are hippie, uh, they are cannabis smoking hippies. And they used the use of cannabis there as, a, as an epithet we must attack these people because they're not like you, they're drug users. And therefore you can discount what they're saying about the war, which we are going to win because we're on the side of right, we're on the side of, of capitalism, and communism is bad. And this is what we tolerate now in our society. This is entirely inappropriate, intolerable, and also undemocratic. We need to follow the science. Now the science, as I have discovered, uh, has, uh, has shown how wonderful this preparation actually is. Now, I'll say again, for the purposes of all in society, all, abusing cannabis is not acceptable. It's not a sensible thing to do. It does do damage if you're going to abuse it. Giving high-dose THC to young growing brains is a good way of ruining a young growing brain. We don't want that. We want to regulate the use of a healthy healing herb which can be abused, such that it can be enjoyed socially in a much safer way than alcohol currently is. And I would like to have the restrictions removed because of our fear of, of, of cannabis. I'd like the restrictions to be removed on growing industrial hemp, which would then open up a multi-billion dollar industry to the world, but in particular, I'm very biased here, in particular to Western Australia, where we are able now to transform our microclimate and our society in ways which would only benefit the people of our state, in any number of ways. Why don't we do that? It's because we're frightened of cannabis. We're frightened specifically of THC. 
And I have to ask you, how many people died of THC in Australia last year? The answer, of course, is none. Last 20 years, none. I've mentioned this umpteen times. We don't have deaths due to THC. We can, of course, if you want to abuse cannabis and then take other drugs, because if you're using illicit drugs, you're exposed to other drugs as well. Of course you are. Like alcohol, like methamphetamine, bad things happen. They would happen anyhow if you're taking alcohol and methamphetamine together. Ask those who have passed away on our roads once you can. How do, can you possibly manage to, to, to drive your car safely if you're going to be using something as, Ill, as, as nasty as these drugs? You don't want to do that. We need to be very careful in what we're actually saying, scientifically. And I was really interested also in hearing how it's described uh, uh, as a hanging offence, a, a literal hanging offence. Well, maybe in Singapore, but certainly not here. Mm. I don't think any people were hanged for, for, for cannabis in Australia. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Perhaps. If you're allowing this to be an illicit substance, uh, you would then get criminals involved. There's a great way of actually increasing criminals' business by making something illegal. The multi-dollar business that we are saying no to, the criminals are actually using, what are they doing with that multi-dollar business? Apart from uh, uh, getting guns for themselves, apart from controlling rural communities, apart from making methamphetamine and transforming to the negative side our, our, our rural communities who are suffering with a, 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 an abuse of drugs, mostly methamphetamine, because it's available and they can make it very cheaply. Giving power to criminals is just not a good way of controlling a community. It's not a good societal choice. We should actually learn by now that what we have done so far has actually caused a problem. And the law that we are uh, proposing, the bill that we have put forward, is a way of regulating, of giving some certainty, security to our state. And I wish, I desperately wish, that we would listen to what the facts are. Now, I very much appreciate what the Leader of the House said uh, about Oregon and the negative effects they've had there. And also what uh, the Leader of the Opposition, the Honourable Peter Collier, said about the, um, the variable results coming in. Now, if we're talking about variable results, let me talk about antidepressants. I'm, as a doctor, I'm going to segue into the variable results of antidepressants. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs. What actually happens here is that uh, if anyone has taken these substances, they will know that they are not actually a universal panacea at all. They might help reduce depression, but they also cause a variety of side effects, including, by the way, death, including anger which probably explains why 50%, so I am told, of those mass murders in the US, uh, mass murderers, they seem to have uh, 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 SSRIs in their system. So the anger might be predisposed to by taking drugs, which are essentially used. I've prescribed kilos of them, kilos of SSRIs. There are adverse effects. So what's actually happening when these drugs are put on the market? Let's take 10 drugs are created, but well, one drug is created and 10 different uh, uh, research has been done. What actually happens is three will show that the research shows a benefit, three will show it has no benefit, and four will be around about saying, well, either way, it, it, it's, it's kind of in between. Can you guess of those 10 studies which are published by the drug company? And of course, you've got it, those three will show a benefit. The other ones don't see the light of day. So when you're thinking that we're taking medication which is scientifically proven, it's actually only half the story. Now let's look at cannabis and see what's going on with that. What are we actually looking at? Now I was speaking with an eminent colleague of mine, a professor who has prescribed a lot of cannabis and done the studies for that. And I've asked him about what we're getting out of the US. And he says, oh, that is an absolute dog's dinner. Because the research that is being done there with their approach to cannabis and the freedom that they've got you got, you might say it's good on the one hand. On the other hand, they're getting very, very sloppy research. So we've got to be look very carefully at what's going on there. And this is why, again, I say we must look at the research and assess it properly with an open mind. And I will admit to these research studies from the US which are showing negative results. But when you look at what's actually going on, you're seeing a lot of areas of concern. We need to do more valid scientific research. And you know what? I think Australia is the best place to do that because uh, there are instances where scientists have done the wrong thing, of course. But in general, 
When it comes out of Australia, I'm relatively certain that the research there is valid. Even then, we're going to get different results because we know that observer bias influences the outcome of the, the uh, research. So we have to be careful with this. But what I will absolutely state is that in my almost 4,000 cases of patients with cannabis just now, I have had, on the fingers of one hand I can count, the number of people who have, have uh, had adverse effects. And were they major adverse effects? No. I've had one case of psychosis. One case of psychosis. And that was of someone who was actually predisposed in the first place. So what I'm asking for here, and uh, what is going to be voted down, of course, but what I'm asking for here is that we look at this with open eyes, with an open, with a clear mind, and with the recognition that our conditioning has led us to think in a certain way that does not reflect reality. And I would ask this House to take that into, into, into effect, into, into, into their thinking. This bill will not pass, but I am very hopeful that in the near future, sane minds will look at this again because the benefits to our community far, far outweigh the relative risks of allowing cannabis to become legal. Far, far outweigh the risks and result in reduced drunkenness, reduced violence in the streets, reduced domestic violence, increased uh, gross domestic product, I would assume, because we're now able to then to use the full plant to its benefit. For example, I've said this many times before, the $23 million yield from a hectare of cannabis or industrial hemp on uh, an average acreage here in Western Australia, $23 million, if you can use the full plant. Why would we not want to make use of that? And so I thank the, um, uh, the, the, the House here, not just for listening to me today, but also for the last three years, and I'm hoping for the next five years, uh, when we're going to be hearing this again and again, me calling for open minds, a scientific approach, and looking at the truth of the issue. And with these few words, I'll thank the House and sit. Members, the question is the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. No. I think the noes have it. Um, members, the question is the bill be read a third time. That's it. Why doesn't why doesn't it go to a third read? Why didn't it go? Because he hasn't said anything. Okay. So it's defeated. Um, I don't know, no, no. Sorry, members. <laughs> I might have. No, I'm not even suggesting what is on my mind. Um, members, we now go to Misuse of Drugs Amendment Bill 2021, uh, and. The question is, the bill be read a second time. Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I rise as the lead speaker to indicate the government cannot support this bill. The drug trafficker declaration provisions in the Misuse of Drugs Act 1981 came into effect in December 1990. Section 32A is the main component, which provides that when persons are convicted of relevant serious drug offences or drug offences where the quantum of, of the drug or the plant is not less than the amount that's outlined in Schedules uh, 7 and 8, the prosecutor can make an application for a drug trafficker declaration. Once that application is made, the court is legally bound to make the declaration. There's no discretion available to the court. Once a declaration is made, various provisions under the Criminal Property Confiscation Act 2000 and the former Crimes Confiscation of Profits Act uh, of 1988 are enlivened, which can result in freezing or confiscation of assets. That section 32A has remained largely unchanged since enactment. Uh, Schedule 7 has been um, updated over time to include various synthetic cannabinoids and steroids. Schedule 8 was updated in April 2011 to change the amount of cannabis plants down from 250 plants to 20. And the reason for these changes was to address the cultivation of cannabis plants by hydroponic means, which results in significantly higher yields than cannabis plants grown by normal methods uh, of cultivation. Two key reasons why the government can't support uh, this amendment bill. Firstly, we don't support any amendments that put the community at greater risk. The bill will result in the law becoming weaker and potentially encourage an increase in the use of illicit drugs and at the danger of more harm to individuals with the penalties reduced. 
Our government has delivered amendments to the Misuse of Drug Acts that make it harder and more difficult for drug trafficking to occur in our state uh, with the introduction of the border uh, search areas. Um, secondly, any changes to the drug trafficker declaration provisions of the Misuse of Drugs Act 1981 should not be considered in isolation from any changes that may be contemplated to the Criminal Property Confiscation Act 2000. The member has referred in his support of this uh, to the Martin Review. Um, as the Attorney General has indicated in response to questions in this House, the Martin Review made more than 60 recommendations canvassing both legislative and administrative matters, with the primary recommendation being that the government give consideration to repealing and replacing the Act in its entirety. Noting that the criminal property confiscation scheme is complex, any reform, should it be pursued, would be a large body of work. We cannot support an amendment bill that simply cherry picks one recommendation of the Martin Review in isolation of due consider consideration to the review in its entirety. For those reasons, the government will not be supporting the bill. Members, the question is the bill be read a second time. The Honourable Brian Walker in reply. Thank you, President. And you'll be getting used to my voice, I'm sure, and probably bored, mindless. This is going to be a very short reply. And again, I thank the government for, for their views and I understand where they are coming from. Now, it must be stated that this, um, uh, amend this amendment here is, is actually being brought because it's actually been five years since that uh, review was, uh, uh, was, was created. And one part of that review, I'm going to read uh, 8.4 of that review. <coughs> I'm going to quote the uh, Honourable Wayne Martin in that report. He says, the most significant issue in my review of the Act and the submissions I have received is whether the court should have a general or more narrow discretion to direct that all or some part of property not be confiscated on the grounds that the confiscation is contrary to the public interest or the interests of justice. I've also had multiple uh, communications from lawyers and indeed from judges who are asking basically for the freedom to do what needs to be done themselves. Because the impact of this law is that the, the judge who is going to listen to both sides of what's going on, both lawyers' sides, the judge needs to be able to make a judgment of to what is actually going on. Whereas on the prosecution side, what they're basically saying is we're going to go for the maximum penalty and then you can work it down, of course, but the maximum penalty, and we'll see where it goes. And in this case, the judge has no discretion. Now, any time we have a judge being refused the ability to make the, their own opinion about something, we actually have the risk that uh, we're going to have a manifest injustice. And indeed, this is exactly what we have seen. We are not at all suggesting that the law would become weaker. No, not at all. The law could become stronger, in fact. What we're simply asking for is that the, 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 the qualified people, the lawyers and the judges, be allowed to actually be lawyers and judges. This is a manifest injustice. Now, the, the review was from 2019, I think it was, and we've asked a number of occasions why has no uh, progress been made. And the answer is because, as the Leader of the House has pointed out, it's actually a very big bill, very complex. And so what I'm wondering is why has not even the start been made on working on it? The information I have is that not even a start has been made. And so, five years on, we are having, again, manifest injustice throughout our legal system where people being confronted by this legislation are suffering, improperly suffering, unjustly suffering. And the system is now created such that there is no redress, there is no recourse, there is no ability to uh, receive manifest justice, however that justice may fall out. And this is really all we're asking for. Now, if we, the whole bill, the complex bill, needs to be rewritten, that we will accept. But one part of it, one simple one, let, let's think of the Monty Python film with that last fine little after-dinner mint. Would that really cause this law to be burst? That little after-dinner mint of just allowing the judge to actually make their own opinion. Does that bring this law to an explosion? Does it really? Of course it does not. 
I can see very well why you'd want to do four things and make it all proper, much like the firearms legislation coming through. We're going to do the whole thing in one go. I can, I can see where you're coming from. But if we find in a legislation that one part of the existing law is manifestly unjust, it's wise to fix that now, as, in fact, we have seen in multiple changes to the Misuse of Drugs Act over the course of this last three years of Parliament has happened already. This is not an exception. It's just not part of the, the changes that the government supports. So we've just, I think, two or three uh, uh, amendments to the, to the Misuse of Drugs Act have gone through our House already in this term of Parliament. But this one hasn't. So the argument that we, we can't do this because we need to fix the whole in one go actually doesn't hold water. But I can see where you're coming from. And what I'm standing for here is that we consider this and that we do consider uh, in the second reading that we allow justice to be applied by those who are permitted to dispense justice. Not that we've decided in advance, we'll take this to court, and you, judge, have no choice, because I have decided, as the prosecutor, this is what you're going to do, and you don't have any choice in, this, in the matter anymore. You've got no say. This, this is manifestly unjust. And I would ask that all sides consider this very seriously, because it is not just a matter of one part of a law. It's a matter about applying justice to the people, serving the people. This is why we're here. And at the moment, we have a manifest injustice. And I cannot stand here and leave that unaddressed. So I ask your indulgence that you understand where this is coming from. It's not about supporting cannabis at all. Not at all. It's about supporting justice. And in those words, I thank you and sit. Members, the question is the bill be read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, say no. No. The no's have it. Members, that takes us to item three, criminal confiscations under the Criminal Property Confiscation Act 2000. Uh, and the Honourable Brian Walker has moved that this House calls upon the Cook Labor Government to impose a moratorium on criminal confiscations under the provisions of the Criminal Property Confiscation Act 2000 until such time as the findings of the 2019 Martin Report have been addressed. And the question is, the motion be agreed. The Honourable Brian Walker. Thank you, President. Um, President, I move the, 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 the motion in my name that this House calls upon the Cook Labour Government to impose a moratorium on criminal confiscations until the provisions of the Criminal Property Confiscation Act 2000, until such time as the findings of the 2019 Martin Report have been addressed. Members, the Honourable Brian Walker has moved that motion, and the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Brian Walker. Thank you, President. Now, a lot of what I intend to say has already been said. In fact, it's been supported by the government already uh, that we all can agree that the, the, the Martin Report 2019 must be addressed. And we can also agree, I think, if you listen to my words uh, and you find nothing objectionable in the fact that we want justice in our, in our system, it'd be difficult to object to the concept that if a law is currently in force, if an act is currently in force, and as a result of enforcing that act, a manifest injustice is being, called, being caused, then it makes manifest sense that we ought to impose a moratorium on that particular part of, the, of, of, of legislation to allow for justice to take place. Now, I don't think that's a, a, a very much, I do not believe that that is a, an object of contention. We all surely are going to support the concept that the legal system is there to ensure justice is being seen, is being done, that justice be applied equally to all. And when we discover laws which clearly do not meet that high standard, then we, as a body, as a parliament, are obliged, are we not, to either remove that law or to amend it or to rewrite it. This is one of our essential functions. Now we have, uh, as I said earlier, in the Criminal Property Confiscation Act 2000, an eminent legal mind has given the very strong opinion that this law must be changed. And I'll, I'll say it again, just to, for the benefit of Hansard, quoting again. Um, that the confiscation is contrary to the public interest or the interests of justice. The most significant issue in my review of the Act 
and the submissions that I have received is whether the court should have a general or more narrow discretion to direct that all or some part of property not be confiscated. On the grounds that the confiscation is contrary to the public interest, or on the grounds that it's to the interests, uh, contrary to the interests of justice. That is a very serious statement. So what he's saying here is that the law as it currently stands is actually against the interests of society and against the interests of justice. Now, I would like very much to hear how someone could stand up to the Honourable Wayne Martin and give an adequate explanation of why he is wrong. One of the most eminent legal minds in our time. How can we then stand up and say, actually, you're wrong, mate. No, you got, you got it, you're wrong. All the, the, the information that's come into, into the, uh, to the uh, committee, all of the examinations that have been done, this being the conclusion, no, nah, we don't believe you, you're wrong. And th this, so unless someone's prepared to do that with an equal legal eminence, then I, I think it's difficult to argue against the, the motion. Now, the motion has, however, been worded not uh, to criticise the government. Not at all. This is my point of view that uh, I have always stated that those who are working in this building, in this establishment, are of high standards, high moral standing, and are doing their best to serve the people of the state. I will always maintain that. And so I'm not going to tolerate the idea of, of shouting across the chamber and saying you're wrong or you're, you're bad or you're, you're, you're doing horrible things. That, that doesn't serve the public interest. What I'm calling upon here is a moratorium on criminal confiscations under these particular provisions. And I'm not asking even for the law to be changed. It just this particular part, let's call a bit of a halt. Let's say to the prosecutor, let's say to the judges, we're not going to actually work this particular part of the, of the, of the act. Now, you could say, we can't do that. But I, I then point out the public health uh, law, 2016 or 2018, there's a, there's a clause there which allows a police officer to strip you naked and to have you forcibly administered an injection of whatever against your will at the command of the police commissioner. Now, that's, that's fairly tough stuff, isn't it? You can get stopped, if you're identified by the, the commissioner of police, now we, we need to do something to you, and you can be stopped. And if you don't agree to it, they can actually stop you, strip you naked, and have you forcibly injected, uh, hopefully by a doctor or someone who's medically trained, against your will. Now you might then say, well look, okay, this is just in the pandemic and we've got to make sure that people are safe. Okay, I've done that actually uh, with uh, patients myself uh, who've been mentally ill, they've been forcibly t under the care of the police, who are the only people allowed to do this, by the way, because I'm not allowed to use force on someone, but the police officer can. And they have been stopped, they have been uh, forcibly uh, um, uh, undressed, at least all undressed, but they've, they've been exposed, and I've then been enabled to inject that patient with something as an antipsychotic to calm them down from their rampage. They want to, to uh, kill someone, they want to, to destroy the ED, they want to um, kill their, 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 their partner uh, because of a psychotic process. That makes it, that's a very sensible law. But I need to fill in forms for that, forms one and, uh, schedule one and two, to allow the police officer to do that. So there's very strict controls. And when that person is now transferred to a psychiatrist, they need to examine again what's going on here. And just to be certain, is Dr. Walker behaving in the right way? Was this an appropriate uh, action? Shall we reverse this? Or shall this person remain as an involuntary patient until the psychosis has been treated? And when I questioned this in specific regard to say the pandemic, with the idea that you could be forcibly stopped, stripped, and injected with an uh, anti-COVID vaccine. It was told, and this is brought in, of course, by the Liberal government, uh, I was told by colleagues on the Liberal side that, oh, yeah, uh, we're, we're never going to enforce that. We, we brought that in, we, we're never going to enforce that. So when I then said, well, if you were never intending to enforce that, why was it actually in the statute book anyhow? If we've got the permission to do that, and uh, right now, a police officer at direction under certain conditions can do that. It's in, the, it's in the books right now. This can happen at any stage, at any time, legally. Uh, why is it in the statute book? 
he, there's another case here. That, that's, that's theoretical. I know it's never going to happen because it's just improper, but it's in the statute book. But there's a patient of mine a little while back uh, who was sexually abused as a child and has uh, PTSD and is actually really quite distraught. And I've said the story before, her father was growing cannabis in the backyard because that was an effective cure or treatment, not cure, treatment for her PTSD. She could actually exist without actually wanting to kill herself. And so the police discovered that and he was arrested and she was arrested. Now, bearing in mind, she was arrested for using cannabis that her father was giving her growing in the backyard. She was then put in the back of a police car alone. She was taken to a police station and there at the police station, a child of sexual abuse as a child with PTSD was strip searched. Now, I challenge anyone here to tell me that's going to help the PTSD in any way or form. Has harm been caused? It absolutely has. Is that person still suffering the trauma of that event? Yes, they are. How do I know? Well, I'm their doctor. Was it illegal? No. It was very much legal. We have permitted that. So the trauma of that, per uh, that person has been exacerbated because of us. We may not have passed that particular law, but we are in a position of power to change that, and we have not. What's that being said? Those who, the, 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 the assault you walk past is the assault you tolerate? The offence you walk past and say nothing is the offence you tolerate? The abuse that we have created and walked past is also the abuse we tolerate. I ask you, members, do we really want to be that kind of person? And so the motion I'm putting forward here is basically this. Let us stop causing injustice. Let us stop permitting injustice. Let's put a moratorium forward such that justice can be seen to be done and that appropriate action can be taken to amend the laws which are causing injustice. It's a simple thing here, and I, I would uh, anticipate that we would agree with the principle of not causing harm, would we not? Members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, President. And I rise uh, on behalf of the government to give its response to the member's motion, uh, the third limb of his uh, non government business today. Uh, and so, uh, what I can um, pretext my uh, response uh, on member is that it will be brief. Um, and there's a number of reasons, or some short reasons for that. Um, the first of that is that um, your motion calls for a very specific thing, which is a moratorium on the criminal confiscations under the Criminal Property Confiscation Act. Uh, and then you um, uh, condition that on until such time as the findings of the 2000 and Martin, 2019 Martin report have been addressed. Um, and I suspect, Member, what you actually meant, rather than the findings of the Martin report, you meant the recommendations of the Martin report, because uh, the report doesn't, I think, make any specific findings as such. Um, it makes a almost 60, I think it is, recommendations. Now, a number of those recommendations relate to administrative matters. They don't relate to legislative changes. Um, and uh, a number of those recommendations also pertain to uh, bodies, such as the Department of, uh, the Director of Public Prosecutions, who um, has independent decision-making from government. So there is a fundamental impracticality about what you're suggesting, which is for the government to direct the independent DPP to not enforce the law. And we don't have that power, Member. That's an impermissible use, uh, would be impermissible, um, and a, uh, a breach of the independent decision making of the DPP, which exists for a number of very important reasons. The other, um, uh, perhaps more uh, weighty reason uh, at a practical level um, is that whilst your motion is undoubtedly uh, well intentioned, um, it is somewhat naive in what it's asking for. Um, and if it was given effect, um, it would have open slather, it would provide open slather for the criminals who are the subject of this uh, legislation um, uh, to uh, essentially benefit from their ill gotten gains. Because the fundamental role of the Criminal uh, Property Confiscation Act is to um, uh, prevent uh, those that are engaged in criminal enterprise 
from profiting from those enterprises. That's the fundamental objective of that Act. Now, um, the Martin Review obviously recognised a number of areas of reform, um, a number of areas of uh, possible unintended consequence and of unfairness, but the fundamental role of that particular um, uh, legislative scheme is to deny those that engage in criminal enterprise the profit the benefit, the fruit of that enterprise. And I don't think any responsible government could um, uh, institute a moratorium that it would allow criminals to uh, enjoy the fruit of their ill-gotten gains. So on that basis, Member, we can't support your motion. Members, the question is the motion be agreed. All those of that opinion say, oh no, we don't put the question because uh, because the time for debate um, will expire and because the questions aren't put under non-government business. So that takes us to orders of the day.